Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Talking Rugby Union podcast. My name is Joe Harvey, and I'm joined by Chris Hill, who's another TRU contributor, the TRU editor, main man himself, uh, as well as Amptill, Lockford, Charlie Beckett. How are you both? We'll start off with, with Chris on that one. Yeah, good, thanks, mate. It's good to catch up on the podcast. Uh, towards the end of the Six Nations, after our last one before the Six Nations, and we just before we press record there, we were discussing that our predictions were way, way, way wider the mark. So I'm sure we'll be getting into that, Joe. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Charlie, how are you? I'm good, thank you, mate. I am happy to be playing rugby again. I'm in a season. I'm a happy man, mate. I'm happy. Ah. No, I'm good. I'm very well. There's lots of rugby to watch. Yeah, life, life is good, thank you. Sun's out, as you can see, streaming through the window. Um, and yeah, mate, we're on the road, sort of normality again, aren't we? So I'm very, very excited for that. Uh, but no... Mainly, I'm playing rugby again, so I'm happy. Thank you. How, Joe, how are you? No one's asked you how you are. Yeah. You all right? Oh, I'm all right. I mean, I'm... So I've had to move to the... Uh, I've had to... I'm currently at my stepdad's working because I have no Wi-Fi at home. Chris has had this this rant at him. So I'm I'm currently working at the farm, which sometimes is really good, but then also times really bad because sometimes people come down the drive and I have to deal with that. That's always fun. Um, because apparently that's what people do to farms. They just go down the drive. I didn't realise this. I mean, who knew? But anyway, we're also going to be joined by TRU contributor Callum Wood a bit later on to talk about all things the championship, because, of course, Charlie's he's Amtil captain these days. He's captain Amtil rugby club. All right, let's, let's get this. <laughs> to, I was Amtil captain once because Louis was on the bench. And Sam Hudson's vice captain was injured. So I was best of a bad bunch. We then got absolutely battered, 54-6. And then I wasn't captain the week after. So it was not. it was maybe the least successful captaincy in the history of captaincy, but um, no. So thanks for bringing that one up, Joe. I, I, I'm I'm still I'm still very proud. Okay, that's what I'll Thank say you, about Joe. it. I, you. I sent Thank you a nice you. message as soon as I saw that. You did. You did. You did. You sound you sound like my grandma, Joe. I'm very proud of you, Charlie. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, it's very kind. Very kind. It's all right. I sent you money on your birthday as well, so that's kind of another side of it. That 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 never arrived. <laughs> oh, that's convenient. Uh, is, anyway. that what, is that what we need to do, Joe, with our? Main men at CRU send money on birthdays. Is that a, is that a precedent you've now set? No, like a message in the WhatsApp chat's fine. Yeah. As, as per. Message like over us. Instagram. But anyway, we'll start off with the Six Nations. Um, obviously, we said at the start of this, just before we started recording, we all said England were going to win the Six Nations. That's not gone to plan. They finished fifth overall. That can't even be changed by this weekend's rearranged fixture between Scotland and France. Um, yeah, fifth overall. Chris, what, what, what do we think? What do we think have been the main issues before we get to Charlie who actually knows things about rugby? Where do you want to start, Joe? Um, you know, I think we talked on the podcast before the Six Nations about kind of giving some of those players who haven't had a look in England a bit of a chance. And I think we were talking about, you know, Harry Randall at the time. Uh, I think we did a little bit on Paolo because obviously Charlie knows him and has played with him. And we were quite excited. We were like, go on, this is a chance for them to to get a game, we pinpointed the Italy match and to try and get some new players in and it just hasn't happened. Mm. And, you know, after that, I mean, even before the Italy game and when the squad was announced, it was like, well, what's Eddie doing? And then what hasn't helped is the way some players have just stepped up the game in the Gallagher Premiership. And um, the list is endless. You know, as obviously Sam Simmons, Marcus Smith, those guys take the line like that there's... There's guys who have been around for four or five. I mean, Mike Brown, Danny Kerr, arguably playing some of their best rugby they have done and won't play for England as long as Eddie Jones is still the coach. And it, it just doesn't look good for Eddie. And I think maybe the France win could have papered over the cracks. But last Saturday's first half against Ireland, I think, showed that change needs to happen. And he talks about kind of resetting and evolving. And I guess that takes time as well. But when you've got... It seems like everybody else can see it apart from Eddie. And... Mm -hmm we were hoping we were going to see some sort of change. It hasn't happened. It, in, in a way, I agree with Clive Woodward's comments on Saturday on ITV, where he's saying they've gone backwards since that semi-final win against New Zealand. It, it's rough as an England rugby fan at the moment. It's, you know, it's, I've not been excited watching England at all. Maybe that first half against Wales, when they start to come back into it, that was probably the most exciting part of the, of the tournament. For me. But yeah, there's more questions than answers coming out of this Six Nations where, you know, two years out for a World Cup, we don't want to be in this situation with a coach who's been there for, for six years now. 
Yeah, certainly. And obviously, I'll, Charlie, I'll come to this, but I'll just give, I'll give you a little extra information as well, which is that Eddie's already been on the phone with Conor O'Shea and Bill Sweeney, and he's been talking about players for 2023 and as well as 2027, even though he's fully aware he might not be there. It's obviously He's obviously not someone who is keen to leave it by any stretch. He's obviously still got the fight there. But what, what kind of your opinions on it? Because it is, it is one of those where people are saying, actually, it could be the right time for Eddie to leave. It's sort of like, first of all, Eddie Jones confuses me, as he does many people, I think. His relationship with the media is strange when he started calling the media poison the other day and just there's so much. I think the confusing thing is he talks about evolving and that sort of stuff, but I don't see it reflected in his selection, um, either of his wider squad and then more so his match day squad. As, as Chris spoke, there are players who, if I was Sam Simmons, I'd just be laughing now because I don't know what more I can do. Like, the man is arguably the best eight in the world. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes on the Lions tour. I, I would not be surprised if he goes on the Lions tour because the way he's playing. But he, he can't get a look in. Now, I've got nothing against uh, George Martin from Tigers. I think he's a good young player. But how's, how's he going ahead of Simmons, Don Brandt, these players? Like, I, I don't understand. I'm confused. Um, I think, so what's the issue with England? I think the biggest, the biggest thing I can say, and this, this hurts me as an Englishman to say, is I, I, I'm bored watching England. I, each weekend of the Six Nations, the fixture I've been looking for is the French fixture. That's the one I want to make sure I'm sat down in front of the telly for. for. And if I had to choose genuinely, the first time in my life, I had to choose between watching France and watch, watching England. I was, if there was only one game I could watch, I'd watch the French one. Because I, I, I'm an England supporter. I'm English and through. Playing for England, the, the proudest day of my life is captaining under 18s. Playing for England under 18s, 16s, 20s is, to this day, the biggest achievement of my life and will always be the pride of my life. I couldn't be proud to be English. I love England. I want to see England win. I don't enjoy watching English rugby team at the moment. And it's, it, break, it breaks me to say that. And I've got good mates in that side and around the squad and who are involved. And it just it doesn't excite me watching England at the moment. Now, I'm a big believer that you go on a pitch to win. You go on a pitch to win. And sometimes it's not pretty. And sometimes you win 3-0 or you win 6-3. But I just think the way rugby is at the moment as well, I think playing a better style of rugby gets the players more excited and you get better results. I do believe that. I think you can be as pragmatic as you want, but at some point you have to play play the game. I don't think you're going to do that at the moment. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's been a tough watch, England. Uh, this Six Nations, almost as tough as me watching Wales do brilliantly after I said on our preview that I thought Wayne Pivak, if they didn't do well, could be, uh, could be in for the sack, losing his job. And then they were 30 seconds from winning a Grand Slam. So yeah. that shows, you said at the start, Joe, Charlie knows about rugby. Eh, I'm not sure I do anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe we'll bring you in a bit more on the championship section then. But, you know, we're talking that's, that's about... That's more my area of expertise. <laughs> I don't know what else to do when you say that. <laughs> You're putting me in a corner there, Charlie. Um, but obviously, yeah, you mentioned that. Wait, Wales, completely turning things on its head. Chris, you, you've spoken to people in the Wales camp a couple of times now. And you spoke to Harry Parks recently as well. He's obviously spoken to guys within the Wales squad. Does it seem a different environment? Because it seems like confidence is, I think as I just said before, completely on its head. Yeah. Um, Hadley said at the start of this week when he spoke to me that he's been in contact obviously with a few of the guys, you know, only a year or so ago when he played for Wales. And he said they've just loved the campaign. They've loved being in the Wales camp. They've loved the environment. Um, and Charlie will know with him, you know, having, having that background, in playing, but if you're happy going to work, you're going to perform and you want to perform for the coach, you want to perform for each other. Um, and yeah, the vibe around Wales, I think, has been set by Wayne. I think basically everybody, as Wayne said on Thursday last week, he, he said everyone's kind of bought into what they've been trying to do. And as, the thing is, you know, Charlie sort of slates himself there going, well, I, you know, I thought he might have gone after if he had a poor Six Nations. I think everyone, maybe other than the players, the Welsh players, the Welsh coach and staff and Wayne possibly thought that as well. There's no hiding from the fact that that autumn campaign was dire for Wales in terms of the results. I mean, the game against Ireland in, in Dublin was just, it was just a poor, poor uh, performance and showing for Wales. But, you know, they obviously knew something we didn't. You know, they were, you know, whether it's a twist of fate, I don't know, but actually looking at the depth in the autumn and creating a squad which is Wayne to bring in these players in, it's kind of maybe helped create that environment and create that vibe you're touching on, Joe. And, you know, you've got to say fair play to them. And people, I know, I think someone put on Twitter and on TRU's Twitter about the Wales squad and it, 
sort of linked to a massive chain of events when people go, yeah, but they've had two red cards and, you know, those games against Ireland and Scotland might not have gone their way. But the England performance, to me, just summed it up. I just think they were a team that looked hungrier. They looked fighting for the country. They were fighting for the coach. They knew the direction they wanted to go in. I think that's the difference between Wales and England. There's a the clear direction of where Wayne wants to go. And Wayne, you know, Wayne always talks about and coaches talk about the World Cup cycle. They don't tell me Wayne Pivak hasn't said, well, let's just get this performance, let's strong showing in the Six Nations, go into the summer, go into the autumn and keep building in the right direction. And I think, you know, the, the Wales players have done themselves absolutely proud and they've got a great foundation, even if they don't win it on Friday, uh, based on France and Scotland down from, they've got a great foundation to build and going into the summer, the autumn, and then obviously the 2022 of the year out from the World Cup. I, um, I may have not covered myself in glory with how I spoke about Wales in general and saying I was worried about them going into it, but I'm going to bring it back. Go and find the clip, go and watch. I told everyone before the Six Nations that Louis Rees Zamet was the real yeah. deal. I think yeah. he's more than proved that on the international stage now. My God, that boy's playing well. Boy, he's a man. He's playing well. <laughs> um, he'll, go, he'll go to the Lions this summer. No doubt. I've got no doubt he'll go to the Lions. Is there a... Is, Big statement here. Is there a winger in better form in the world? In the world right now? No. no. Maybe Keith Earls. Yeah. Yeah. Zamit, yeah. Zamit is the real deal. And we just found out yesterday the Lions are going to South Africa. He's one of the first names on the plane right now for me. He's he's just playing a different way to everyone at the moment. It's, it's great to watch. And I think... He's just one of those players, isn't he, that he gets the ball and you get excited. And it's just, I was having this conversation with, um, with Tom Hudson yesterday, actually. We were talking about that. We were looking back at our game for the weekend and I made, I'm going to do inverted commas, a line break. <laughs> <laughs> I, I beat the defender and in my head, in my head at the time, I'd made about 15 metres. You watch it back, I've made two different breaks. So as I say, line break. But we were talking about like how it always feels that you're doing more when you do it. You're always like, oh, I've made 10, 15 minutes there. So I was like, what must it actually feel like being someone like Louis Samet when you do beat the defenders <laughs> and go six metres? What must that moment feel like? Because I haven't, I haven't experienced that since under 11, so I was just bigger than everyone. So, no, I think he's been the real deal. And you see sort of ignited the Welsh side when he, get, when he gets the ball. And that younger side, because Sheedy has had a really good showing. I know he had that kick the ball off the pitch. The other night, Cal, just kick it off, mate. But you learn, don't you? But he's had a great, um, a great debut uh, campaign for Wales and Six Nations. So they got real youth coming through. And like you say, two years out for World Cup, you're Wales, you're in a good place. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, we talked about we talked about Cam Sheedy coming in, and we've, we've mentioned England before. But obviously, Harry Randall, both Harry Randall and Paolo Adogu, now are up for grabs by other international sides now because Harry Randall, Welsh qualified, brought up in Wales, uh, and Paolo Adogu. Obviously, Wales, they lost. Late on against France, extremely late on against France, they had a bit of late discipline. Obviously, whether or not that translates into anything longer, longer term, we don't know yet. But what that does mean is that France's game against Scotland on Friday night at 8 p.m. means that if France win it by a bonus point and by 21 points, they have won the Six Nations for the first time since 2010. We said in the preview podcast, it's completely ludicrous that France haven't won the mm-hmm. Six Nations since 2010. I mean... Everything we've seen from France so far, they've already announced their team for this weekend, you know, and they've brought in Entomac. They've put Fiku on the wing. They've got, uh, I think, Vincent back in centre. They've got Bakatara at 13. Doulan, Peno, and the pack is, is simply monstrous, just without Paul Willems. But they've brought back Bernard LaRue, who's a 20-tackle-a-game man. We, we surely still have to be backing France. And Chris, you, you've had a few natters with Sean Edwards over the months. Um, you, I mean, you have to you have to back France, surely. Yeah, I don't think he would have enjoyed kind of the the helter skelter kind of first half that was part of Wales versus France. But yeah, they, they, I think you have to. I mean, you know, Scotland, I think will want to prove a point for themselves. I think they'd be incredibly disappointed with how the Ireland game went in particular, um, and it seemed you know too many mistakes in that second half were punished by by the Irish. Um, but in terms of France, I think Charlie's right. You know, what he said before, they are the team that everybody wants to watch. And I think, in a way, if they had gone out and beaten Wales and it was, just, you know, what we've seen from France over the last 12 months, it would have been, OK, yeah, 100% France are nailed on. This could, could be a cruise and a breeze for them against Scotland. But I think the fact that they had to put up a bit of a fight as well against Wales, I think would actually do them the benefit of good, maybe just sharpen the mind going into 
into this Scotland game that they if they are 10 15 percent off they could get punished because Scotland will want to prove a point for it. It's hard to look past France. They did incredibly well to get that bonus point because I thought there's no chance against Wales that was going to happen with, as Charlie said, sort of 10 minutes ago, even going into that final minute, I didn't think it was going to happen. So um, I think they, I think Sean will have a, would have had a few words with him this week to try and just tighten up defensively and, and make sure they get those basics right, which can allow them the platform to go on and get the, the bonus point. But um, I think France will probably get the job done uh, on Friday night. Sorry, Charlie, you were no, about sorry. to speak. Yeah, I, I was, I was just going to say on, on the French team, I think Fiku to the wing confuses me. I think you're just starting okay. to see him maybe show the promise that he showed at youth rugby and coming through in the centres now, but the French will do as the French do. Mm -hmm. um, I think what flies on the radar a little bit is because of how much fun they are to watch, and I'll get onto their halfbacks in a second, but that French pack is monstrous. That is not a pack that you would enjoy playing against physically like you the challenge of playing against them is what you dream of you do like that's the sort of game I want to go and play in but you're going to know you've been in the game against that French pack and as much as the French flair is what they're known for every great French side is built on a huge dominant French pack because it then lets their half packs and in this case especially their petit general play the way they do and I just said is there a better winger in the world than Louis Zam at the moment I'm not sure there's a better rugby player in the world than Dupont at the moment that man is just, he's playing on a different level. And you see the love and the six nations that Aaron Smith was giving him on Twitter, who is arguably probably the other best now in the world. He's just like, he's on a different level to anyone at the moment. He just, he just the way he runs a game, he's just, oh, I, I, I could wax the article about him for hours. I won't because I take up the whole podcast. But I think, I think it'll be tough for them uh, on Friday night. I think the Scottish side is the best Scottish side we've seen for a while. You see, they, they took the Calcutta Cup home. Like they're, they're, they're not a bad Scottish side at all. They're building nicely. It's great to see that we met Alex Craig getting in the mix now and getting his first cap of the weekend. Hopefully, get another one this weekend. They've got a good new youth coming through, Red Path, these sorts of people. So, Scotland are building nicely. I think France will do it. I just think the stars are aligned. I think they'll win with a bonus point by 21 points. It would just be, it would, you know, what would be so French would be to win with a bonus point by 20 points. That would be the most <laughs> French thing to do, to somehow, somehow not quite get enough. Or like to not realise they needed 21 and like kick to the corner at the end rather than taking the points, something like that. But no, I think I think we'll see France lift the six nations on um, on Friday. And as much as it was so annoying that that game got cancelled when it did, it's quite exciting to now have this extra game that is so important. We've got this one more weekend of really exciting rugby and Friday night, perfect. I'm looking forward to watching it. Yeah, and the Premiership have already moved the extra game against Gloucester beforehand in order to, to tie it in. So you've got... You can start watching rugby from 5.30 on Friday afternoon, which is, um, I mean, Charlie, you, you, you mentioned to me earlier. You, I'm off this weekend, mate. I'm off, yeah, exactly. I'm off this weekend. i got a rest weekend. So it's perfect, isn't it? It's perfect. Uh, just on the Six Nations while we're here, I know, uh, we mentioned Ireland briefly. I don't know what you're going to answer this, but what do you do with Italy? Well, because yeah. I think I think this is, this is maybe the most disappointing campaign for Italy in a long, long time because they just, they looked poor. Like it, really poor. It is an interesting one, and you. Uh, but then, like you, kind of look at those small things. You, like they've got, a, they've got a scrum half who's nineteen, obviously who you know, Stephen Barney. They've got a fly half who's twenty. They've got an inside centre who's twenty as well. They've got guys that have literally just been introduced to international rugby in Monte Iowane and people like that. There are like these little things that can you look around the team and you say the foundations are here now. If they grow on these foundations, which they haven't done in previous years, where they've maybe changed it out for someone who's just become Italian qualified or someone else come into a bit of decent forms. And instead of sticking to the guy who's in the team, they've just gone to, to someone else. And you look at a few things and you maybe say game lines where they were struggling a bit. Jake's injured. Jake Fledger is injured. So yeah. when he comes back, I mean, I'm going to say next six nations, I think, roughly. Like I think, I think he's... I, I, I don't know. I spoke to Jake recently, but I think it'd be a while yet. So it was a pretty horrid injury he had, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't a nice one. Yeah. OK, so we, we might say like, say summer 2022, for example, we might see him back in an Italy shirt around then, hopefully before. But if we're going to be fingers crossed, uh, fingers yeah, crossed, if we're pessimistic, we'll say summer 2022. And so if we're looking at those things, there are little things in place. And Chris, that centre, Maury, who got a yellow card at the weekend. He was our Italian player of the match when we went to see England under twenties play it's Italy under twenties at Bedford. I thought I recognised the name. I thought I recognised him and heard him before. Yeah, it wasn't me under twenties rugby again, by the way. Um, 
Uh, no, yeah, you're right, Joe. It's, it's a very, it's a very, very young team, and unfortunately, one of the lasting images of this Six Nations is going to be Franco Smith with impediment hands. The yeah. amount of cutaways that the Six Nations director put on the screen of him with his mask on, head and hands, is I think yeah. for Italy, as Charlie says there, what do you do with them now? Um, I mean, we had Seb Negri on the columnist at TRU. Great respect for him. Always says it how it is, and he basically said before the England match that you know what. What does people want to see? You know, do we want to see Italy, Georgia again? Because he was honest. He said, we'll probably beat them again. And what do you do there? You know, how, how many times do Italy and Georgia have to play each other? But I think that's where the, the promotion relegation comes in a little bit more. I think that's a come rather than like a shootout game, have the champion, rugby championship, well, whatever it's called, rugby European championship as that. Give Georgia the chance. If they don't do it, they don't do it. And everyone can say, well, there's Italy again. Italy have earned the right to be here. Let's just set that rather than just say, let's bring Georgia in, taking Italy out, or even maybe, you know, Japan and Fiji could potentially play Italy. I don't know, but I think you just have to explore those ideas now. And um, there's only so many times we can say, oh, Italy are trying things. This, this thing yeah. here, and there's only as many, and we, you know, I've got great respect for them. And um, but I think you've just got to try and open up a few avenues, otherwise, we're just going to go around in circles, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's been, I think, the last time they won a game was 2015. So that's, whatever, five times six is 35 games without a win or something like that, or probably less. What? 35 what, hang on, 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 five times six, six mate. Yeah, 35. No, try again. Joe. Yeah. Try. Joe, try again. Can't, you can't, for people who can't see Joe's oh, doing it's just 30. counting it's on his numbers. 30, <laughs> it's 30, mate, yeah, it's 30. Oh, that's getting cut. Um, um, right. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a question for Chris before we go to the championship part, but I'm very excited this podcast. Uh, anyone who watched our last podcast will know why I'm asking this. What's going on in the Irish A League at the moment, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, not much, mate. Not much. Not I, much. I, I, I'm not being able to see the, the highlights pop up on the BBC. Is um, there maybe a, is there is there a niche on the talk TRU website for a weekly column on Chris's thoughts on the Irish A League? That's I'm what pushing, I like to see. I'm yes, pushing yes, for there it. Is, there is. I'm there pushing is. the commission for it. He's, you know, money talks, Charlie. So if we want it. We can get it. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, no, that was wasn't my finest moment. I haven't been much of an awe since then. Trust me. There's, there's been a lot more rugby to watch since then. There's oh, been a yeah, lot that, more. Rugby I, I made sure to clip that up, by the way, for socials. Everyone is aware of this. I I sought that clip out. I went through that video many times <laughs> to make sure I got that clip. Um, but it, we've got my embarrassing maths clip now. Um, so yeah, that needs to go out. That needs to go out. No, it will. You've got to it take will. the mic out yourself. It will. I, I'm in charge. I'll let Chris write the tweet and I'll send him the video. That, how does that sound? <laughs> he Perfect. whatever he wants about me. Um, and obviously this isn't the end of the Six Nations coverage on TRU because in two weekends time, the Women's Six Nations kicks off. We have literally just had confirmation of that the other day. Myself and Chris were organising a Women's Rugby Six Nations podcast special thing for next week. Still just trying to iron out the kinks on that one because it's going to take probably a little bit of organization which isn't usually our strong suit um <laughs> so we're going to get around to that uh, but we'll just literally talk about the last bit of big news which is the lions tour is going to be taking place in south africa this year um whether or not that's behind closed doors whether or not that is with international fans or not is still up for debate so um i suppose the main question of all this is and i'll start off with chris and then charlie if you you can have your thoughts afterwards does it kill the beauty of the tour if there is no fans I think, yes, I think it does. I think we've seen over the last 12 months how much of a part fans play. And Charlie, I know, did a column on how much supporters are missed at the moment. I think everyone has missed the fans. Us as supporters of rugby as well, we just want to get back in in any ground with a pint and I'm watching, watching rugby. So, yes, I think it does. Um, but also from a, looking at it from a wider perspective and doing a bit of reading, and we had Lou Joe Monier on a Lou Said podcast last year, last summer now, which seems like an age ago. But he was saying how much the Lions supporters energised the team in South Africa in 2009. He said, it, you know, you walked out on that pitch and it was a sea of red everywhere. And I guess that's like the Lions tour anywhere in Australia, New Zealand, it's a sea of red. I think it means more for the Lions, actually. And, you know, you never want to say that because we know how much supporters mean to, to players and, and, and clubs and nations. But I think the Lions fans make it. And I do think it's going to be such a disappointment. I understand, you know, the decision of doing it in South Africa does keep some of that tour element to a degree, I know Jason Leonard has tried to keep said it's trying to keep everything as normal as possible. So go into the back the backyard of the world champions and things like that. But 
I don't think it's going to be the same. It, the fans do make Alliance tour as much as the event, and it's going to be a shame. But I think from a rugby nose point of view and having some rugby to watch over the summer as well, it's it's exciting that we are getting a tour. So, uh, but yeah, I do think it's. I think there's a little bit more negatives and positives to it. Yeah, I think it's it's really tough, isn't it? I think like you want to go on tour, you want to get, so the option to go south, so they're brilliant. But actually, talk about think about the players first. Like the, I, you read everything about going on a Lions tour. It's almost yes, there's playing for Lions huge, but it's almost like the extracurricular side of it. Like in South Africa, going to the going to the um, the wild the game reserves, going and visiting the obviously the poorer part of South Africa, giving back. Now with COVID, they're probably going to be stuck in hotels, aren't they? So it's not quite the same. And I think. As Chris said, the huge, huge bit is the fans. Like on most people's bucket list is going and being a fan of the Lions tour. It, it just looks like the best fun. And I think having the Lions in empty stadiums just seems strange. Was that idea of Australia floated about, wasn't it? But you still don't know if any British people could have got there to watch. I think for me, of all the ideas that were floated, I think it could have been a really cool and a unique op- opportunity to have a Lions series at home. I think it would never make sense ever to do it again. But I think this time, like by summer, it looks like we're going to have crowds in England and Wales, Scotland. You could have had, you could have even made it a four test series if you wanted and gone a test in each country. Like go England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales for a test. I just think, I just think there could have been a chance to do that. And I think it's going to be very, very strange. I think it, it looks like there won't be any fans. I think that's what people seem to be the betting on going to South Africa, that people won't be able to by then. I think it would be very, very odd to see the Lions with no fans when. Yes, it wouldn't have been a tour, but there was potentially an option to have some fans in stadiums watching them. I think that should have been the priority uh, because I just think we've got to get fans back into sport. It's just sport isn't the same without them. Mm. And and uh, just before we kind of before we go into the championship stuff, that I obviously have to, so apparently there's there's some sort of agreement which means that it had to take place in South Africa. Apparently, within the agreement between the Lions and and the, the Southern Nations, there is there is just this Southern Hemisphere nation. Sorry, there is just an agreement with them that it has to take place at this time, within these months. Blah blah blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, what is an interesting side of this, and I don't know if anyone's seen this, England's tour to the USA and Canada is going to take place in England by the looks of things. So, the USA and Canada will be coming over here. So, there will be England will be playing their summer tour in England so that kind of is an interesting aside there as well because of the border situation between the USA and Canada that means that there is going to be international rugby taking place in England anyway and also um, with the Japan game that's due to take place at Murrayfield between the Lions um, that is unsure of how many people are going to be there as well so there's plenty to talk about there Uh, and again it's going to be one of those things that carries on having loads of conversations about in the in the coming months Um, but now we have to do some uh, championship chatter and Callum Wood, I can see, is on the call now. So we'll just get right into that. And we're now joined by TLU contributor Callum Wood to talk about all things championship, uh, as well as obviously Charlie's here as well, captain from time to time of Vant Hill Rugby Club. Um, so obviously, Callum, firstly, thank you very much for joining us. How, how are things with you? you? Have you been enjoying these opening few weeks? Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. Good to see you all. Really good to be on here as well. Yeah. It's been awesome the first three weeks, I think. Um, in terms of the champ, the, the drama and entertainment it's thrown up through the first three rounds has been outstanding, I think. There's been some some really tight games, some mega tries, some big scores and stuff. And uh, I think the standard's improving every week so far. So, yeah, it's been been really enjoyable keeping tabs on it. Yeah, and obviously, thank you very much for, for sending your content to Talking Rugby Union. We really appreciate it. And, you know, we've been really enjoying like reading it before it goes out. And I think me and Chris, me and Chris always send the odd text and just say, yeah, this is going to be a good game this weekend. And that's all testament to you, of course, for, for bigging up the games that maybe a few weeks before that me and Chris would never even thought about. Um, so obviously the first, it's the first three weeks have happened. I think there's only one place really to start with it, which was the most exciting result to have come out of the, the, the championship, which was Cornish Pirates. Beating Saracens at the Meme, I mean, what a way to open up the competition. Yeah, it really is. It's, you know, it's a bit of a watershed moment for the division, really. It's absolutely huge. And kind of anyone who wasn't really aware of the championship before or didn't follow it, that's probably opened their eyes up to it a lot. You know, um, anyone you know, like ourselves who do follow it a bit and know a bit about Pirates, maybe wouldn't have put them as, as favourites or potential winners, but it's maybe not quite as shocking to people who haven't have never seen the Pirates play and definitely don't know about the kind of record down at the Mene as well. You know, the, the game was massively decided on kind of the set piece battle. Um had a 
very aware of how good the Pirates scrum and line out are. And Saracens were completely picked apart in that aspect, and the Pirates were massively deserved winners in that. And um, I think also, you know, Saracens being on a bye week just two weeks after that, it's made it so they've conceded some quite big ground on the likes of Elin and Pirates already, and Doncaster as well. You know, they're already 10 points behind Elin, I think, and nine behind Pirates, uh, playing a bit of catch up already just three weeks into the season. Yeah, definitely. And Charlie, Charlie, you were one of those watching on the other week when that result came in. What was kind of going through your head as someone who was probably looking at Saracens and saying they're going to be tough to beat this season? Yeah, mate, I watched the game live. I, I had the stream on. I watched it. I think when you saw the uh, fixtures come out, anyone like Calum who knows the league, anyone like me who's played in it knows that really if I'd been Saris, the one I wouldn't have wanted first up was Pirates away because... Mm-hmm as trips in the Championship come, it doesn't come much harder. I think they will have flown, but it's a long bus journey for most. It's a flight, which is a, is, is unusual day of a game. Uh, there's so much weirdness of going all the way down to Cornwall. Then you get there and it will have just been so alien to these Saracens players, these internationals who are used to playing in European Cups. Like I can't describe what the changing rooms are like at the Menai without being in the best. The best which I can give is, it's like, so most, most change rooms will be in the stand or be in the stadium. It's like its own little porter cabin, a good 30 metres away from the stand. Right. But also, in the away change room porter cabin, there's no toilets. So you have to then walk <laughs> for another 30 metres to go to a bathroom. And it's just it's just bonkers. It's so different. And Pirates, as Calum alluded to, anyone who knows anything about them knows it's going to be a tough day up front when you go down there. And I'm fortunate. I'm one of very few people around who's actually gone down there and got a win with Jersey. We won eight, uh, an absolute classic. We won 8-7 to seven a few seasons ago. Um, go and dig that one out of the archives. Archives, sorry. But um, honestly, I, I said, when I saw it, I saw that would be a tough game, especially about their internationals. Mm-hmm. And then I think Vincent Cock will be having nightmares about Marlon Walker for years to come. <laughs> like that pirate scrum just took the Sarri scrum apart. Yeah. Uh, and that was the story of the game, really. Um, and as Callum said, it now puts a huge, huge, huge pressure on Sarri's. They're playing catch-up now. They've got to go. They've got to play Ealing still, and Ealing. I've, I've, I've been on the receiving end of Ealing already this season. Ealing, <laughs> they've long been the pretenders to the throne of the championship. Ealing yeah. look better than I've ever seen them look this season. They are a serious side, and it's not ridiculous to say that if Sarries lose to Ealing, they could miss out on the top two. If Sarries lose yeah. to Ealing, and Pirates don't lose again, or only lose to Ealing, it could be an Ealing Pirates top two. As Carl said, Doncaster unbeaten. They're flying under the radar a little bit. So it's the first weekend and then the subsequent results have made this a very, very, very interesting league. I'm far from a done deal of Sarri's being the winner. I'm far from a done deal of him being in the playoff final. Could you imagine if Sarri's weren't in the top two? Now, don't get me wrong. If I was a betting man, I would bet on Sarri's being the top two. I see them being the top two. I would still bet on them winning the league. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think anyone thought three weeks in would be having these conversations. No, no, definitely not at all. And, Chris, obviously, I know that you're pretty, you know, you speak quite regularly to Guy Thompson, who's obviously a TRU columnist, um, plays for Ealing Trail Finders. Um, what was kind of your vibe from him before they started the season? Because obviously, since then, we know that they've gone on to score 161 points in three games. They're, they, I think they scored eight tries on Friday night, which is obviously just staggering. And you got to feel for Coventry, who up to that point, where it was 12 all at half time. What, what was kind of the feeling from Guy going into that? I think, as as always, Charlie's hit the nail on the head there because there is the realistic possibility that because Saracens have kind of, as Callum said as well, that they're kind of making up ground because of the bye week and that that defeat to Corners Pirates. Guy Thompson pretty much said that, you know, it's a shootout. It's a 10-game shootout and you can't really afford to to drop off because the standard is, is so high. And I think listening to him at the time, you're thinking that standard is going to be set. And no disrespect to the other clubs in the championship by Ealing and Saracens, but as the chaps have just alluded to there, you've got Cornish Pirates who've made a fly start. Doncaster aren't going anywhere. I know Callum's going to be doing Doncaster Pirates this weekend for us. It, it seems that Ealing now need to continue going that, that way. And I think that mentality of just focusing one game at a time, as, as Guy said, is, is going to help them there will be the spotlight around that Ealing Saracens game, whatever that may be. But Ealing have got a good march. They've set the tone early on and it's up to the rest of them to catch them. Yeah, it certainly is. And as much as we're talking about these sides that we kind of 
I suppose, yeah, I suppose we do expect them to be up and, up and thereabouts. Uh, who else outside of Amptill, because we're probably going to get a lot of Amptill chat, out, Charlie, in a moment. Uh, Callum, who, who for you has also been extremely impressive in the, in the championship? Because the thing is, you know, it, we only have looked so far and, and only so we've only ventured into the championship so far at this point. Yeah, I, I think we've mentioned all of them briefly in parts there. And I touched on Doncaster a bit, but kind of really impressed with the way they've started, especially, you know, one of the three teams on three wins out of three. Um, you know, well, like I said, they've kind of flown under the radar a little bit. And that, that game against Pirates this weekend is going to be huge, you know, avoiding a, a draw, which is a possibility. One of those is going to come out of the first four weeks of the season with four wins out of four, which is absolutely massive. I think kind of below those four we've mentioned, so Ealing, Pirates, Saris and Donny, but it's quite competitive below that. I think there's seven teams on one win so far. There's only two teams left without a win thus far, so you know, it really is a, a bit of a shake-up going on beneath those four. It's, it's massively exciting. There's been a, a few one-point games, three or four last-minute play tries or kicks so far, so it's, it's just brilliant week on week. And we're going into this weekend. I think it's, it, I, I might be wrong, but obviously you can correct me if I am. I believe it's a Friday night game between Richmond and Saracens, uh, quarter to eight kicker, but it might be Sunday or something like that. I think I was on an RFU call yesterday and Bill Sweeney thinks it's Sunday. That's all I know. But basically, it's not, it's not Sunday, it's Friday. Yeah. Okay. Right. I wasn't going completely bonkers then when, when I was listening to that yesterday. But obviously, Saracens to Richmond, obviously, when you kind of look at that picture, you say to yourself, Saracens win. But obviously, Richmond are coming into this game, having just beaten Jersey, one of the professional setups. Charlie's got a few friends at Jersey. I can't imagine some of the texts that were flying around that, that night. But um, it, that makes it not a, a walkover, doesn't it? First of all, are we, are we shocked Bill Sweeney didn't know what day the championship <laughs> games are on? Uh, well, is, anyone, is anyone shocked at that? Um, I've got my sass out of the way now. Um, so I've got a yeah. quote from Bill to read out in a moment, so it's good. Oh, I could I could feel that this fire. We'll stir the pot. We'll stir the pot. Um, but yeah, I think the the whole world will be shocked if Richmond get anything out of the game against Saris. Yeah. But Richmond are a horrible team to play. Like every time I've played against Richmond, I have not enjoyed it. They just they just don't go away. They they mastered the semi pro um, model before anyone else of. The boys just love playing for Richmond. They buy into the ethos. They look like those boys there this year aren't getting paid any of them. Those boys are playing at Richmond pure because of COVID, purely for the love of playing for Richmond. And they've turned over Jersey this weekend to a full professional side. And from what I didn't watch the game because I was playing myself, but from everyone I've spoken to, like say I know a lot of the boys in Jersey haven't been there last season. You speak to them, Richmond didn't just beat them, they completely outplayed them. I text um, Tom Williams, uh, the fullback for Jersey, said, What happened, mate? said Richmond were the better side. That they were just the better side. So Richmond are by no means the whipping boys of the championship. Just because they've come up and just because they had a tough first weekend, uh, they will be a tough team to beat for everyone. They always are. So, yes, I, I only see it going one way, and that's Saracens getting five points and Richmond getting none. But I promise you, the, uh, the Saris boys will wake up knowing they've been in the game the next day because you always do after a game against Richmond. It's just the way they play. Mm. Yeah, and as we mentioned, obviously, Callum, you've watched the championship so closely over the last few years. When you look at it, do you think that that misconception that the championship is literally just one professional team, essentially, who's going to automatically get promoted, do you think that kind of perception is going to be shown for what it is, which isn't exactly the whole truth? Um, yeah, I think it probably is. Like I mentioned then, it is a massively competitive league. Obviously, there's uh, maybe a bit of a a split in terms of standard between the, some of the professional and semi-pro teams, but you know, it's, it's not a shock when some of the semi-pro teams turn over some of the professional ones, if you kind of watched and followed the championship a bit over the last few years. And um, I think even, even more so considering a lot of the players and teams have had 12 months plus out of the game, I think massive credit's got to go to the 11 clubs involved this year, you know, the staff, the coaches, the players, and just getting a competitive squad together and getting the games on. You know, massive wraps to all of them involved. Um, this season, with kind of no relegation as well, it's so maybe allowed a bit more freedom. Um, I mean, Myers has probably taken a bit of pressure off as well. You know, Charlie might be able to allude to that a little bit more, being involved with, with the club in the division. But, yeah, I think, it, like I said, it's, it's not a helpful misconception, really, and it's kind of one that's made without closely following the league and, 
having too much knowledge on it, I think. I think, I think as well, this, this season is unique in the fact that coming out of COVID, a lot of players um, have been released or players who are leaving professional clubs have ended up not being able to get a deal because of, uh, because of the COVID outbreak and the lack of money in the sport and just in the world in general at the moment. So you find yourself with a lot of the semi-pro sides have got a huge number of what you would perceive to be professional players there. Like, I use myself as an example. I've been professional rugby since I've been 16. Like, I had no intention of going to a semi-professional club. But the way the cards fell with the way I, my time ended at Gloucester and I, I was desperate not to fall out of the rugby circle, which a lot of boys have at the moment. A lot of guys aren't playing because they just couldn't get anything. So I jumped at the first opportunity I had, which was Ampthill. Now, I can't say enough great stuff about it. It's helped. It genuinely is. Playing for Amateur has helped me fall back in love with rugby. It really is. And I don't, I, I make no secret of this, I don't intend to be semi-pro for too long. I, the, the aim is to get back to the top leagues to play professionally. But you're seeing a lot of quote-unquote professional players playing for those semi-professional clubs. So yourself, you've got Llewellyn Jones uh, with us at Amateur and Sekiro Mig. He's been professional for however long. Ed Coulson over at Nottingham. You've got Jack Stapley over at Nottingham. Boy, these are boys I know who have come out of professional sides now. Luke Jones at Richmond was full time. He was at Richmond before, but was full time at Jersey. Luke's one of the best commands I've ever played with. He's playing for Richmond. Like so, these semi-pro sides. Yes, their budgets are limited. Yes, their um, resources. Yes, they don't train as much. Yes, all these things. But actually, you look at the 15, the 23 they're putting on the pitch on Saturday, and there's some seriously good and seriously professional players in there. I think you're seeing that more so than years past because a lot of players aren't getting the professional deals because of COVID and the lack of money. So actually, they're going to these semi-professional sides. And actually, subsequently, while the setup may be semi-professional, but because there's more professional players in there, the standards are being raised, training is better, the, the games are better, the performances, and then you're seeing the divide between the professional and semi-professional kind of minimising a little bit. So I think that's got a huge part to play this season of the quality of and calibre of player turning out for the quote-unquote semi-pro sides is probably higher than we've seen before. I think that's probably the silver lining, isn't it, Charlie? That it has been a tough 12 months for, for the Championship and a tough 12 months for those players who may have been searching for pro contracts. But as you said, it creates a environment where their names can get out there again so people don't forget about them. But also, I know Callum has, has raised a number of players in his reviews that seem to be cropping up as the weeks go by. And it's, in a way, those professional players, as you say, Charlie, are helping those semi-professional players get their name even more out there. So despite all the difficulties there is some kind of shoots of recovery and some positivity there? I think, I think, mate, in a really weird way, COVID and what it did to the sporting landscape of this country and the world, but let's, let's use rugby in England because that's what we're talking about, might be the best thing that's happened to the Championship in ages because what, we, what everyone's forgotten because of the COVID outbreak is the RFU was done with the Championship pre-COVID. The RFU cuts came in pre-COVID. They came in last January, February, I think, and COVID hit March. So yeah. they, they, they were done. I remember writing my piece to TRU in Jersey before COVID was a thing. So they came in at the start of 2020. The RFU were done with it. Now you look at the fact that because premiership sides are having to um, tighten the belts, like I, I think um, if COVID had hit, Gloucester probably would have re-signed me just to be a squad player. I would have been there, but they couldn't afford to because of COVID. They couldn't carry extra players. So that's why I wasn't re-signed at the time at Amptill. So I'm playing in the championship. There's a lot of players with similar stories to that. Then also you've got the fact that, so, so that raises the calibre of the championship because the calibre of player. You then look at the fact that people cannot go to the championship games, so they're having to stream it to, call, to um, raise revenue. I think 24-7 are doing an excellent job of the stream. I've been so impressed with the quality of it. I think it's excellent. Now, I would be fascinated to see the numbers of people who are watching the games because I, I reckon from the coverage is getting online, if you're talking about it, it is more than just the people who would be going to the games. More people are watching the championship. And then more people have this circle of more people are watching it. It's a high caliber rugby at the moment. And it's just that circle of actually there's a real niche, not even niche, there's a real market for the championship. We need for English rugby to prosper. We, I just believe it so, so passionately. We need a second division and we need it to be as professional as possible because you look at the players who if the championship wasn't happening now, wouldn't be playing. I wouldn't be playing. I would not be playing rugby right now. There are so many, all those professional players at Ealing wouldn't be playing. All these excellent players at Doncaster will be playing, the lads at Rich, everyone will be playing rugby. So in a weird way, COVID might be the best thing that's happened to the champ because it's got new eyes on it. It's reinvigorated it. This is a straight shootout this season. It's a little, it's a sprint finish. So actually there's some excitement around it. I just think, I, sorry, I just hope that coming out of it, 
they are if you see, I don't know what you've spoken to Bill about, Joe, but they are if you see the worth in it and they see what it can give and that going into next season when people are allowed and we cannot wait to have fans back, but that you can still watch the game somehow. Because if you can't, how can you expect to be interested in a league or a sport or anything? I've had the same conversation around women's rugby. How can you ask us to be interested in it if you can't see it? You can't ask people to be interested if you can't watch it. It's just the most basic thing for me. Yeah, no, obviously couldn't agree more. And obviously, the, the, I think there's a piece that's gone out today, which has got Giselle Mathis quotes on the whole situation, including the WSL deal, which is with the BBC and Sky, which is something like £24 million pounds across uh, three years, so until 2024. Uh, and then also we talk in that piece, it, it talks about with um, with the women's games, the AP15s, because obviously that's getting live streamed for free on the RFU um, YouTube, but I think Facebook channels as well. Um, but as we've mentioned, Bill, now a couple of times, I'll read out this quote and because it, it makes some interesting thoughts. It was, for a que- it was from a question that was asked by Rob Kitson at The Guardian. Uh, might as well try and make sure that I don't take any credit for it because because he'll tell me off. Um, OK. Uh, again, there is a misconception here that the, the feeling is the RFU has no respect for the championship. That is not the case. The championship has always been part of the pathway that the work we are trying to do here is to find a way to make to make sure there is a sustainable game, both for the premiership and the championship. And as and that was as a, as a great result for Cornish Pirates against Saracens a while ago. Everyone likes to see the underdog win. and I think it was good for the game. Chris, hand outstretched. <laughs> Got to be careful what we say here or do we? But it's, it's just, I think that's just an empty statement. That's something I could say. And I have no authority in rugby union or anything ever. That's something I could turn out and be like, oh, that's a good point, Chris makes. You want a bit more clout behind it, a bit more of a powerful statement. Say, yeah, the Cornish Pirates result was great, but this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to try and do. Okay. I just don't think there's enough focus on it. There's not enough saying, well, we know the product. We're going to try and do this. We'll keep you all informed. Keep everyone updated. It's, I just think it's, it's empty words, unfortunately. And, okay. and I know they've got a lot on the plate at the moment. I know there's so much going on, but they just, I think Charlie's right. It's in the spotlight. The streams have been great. The commentary has been great. We've been able to access it. Let's build on it. Let's try and build on it. And if we don't, we're going back to square one, I think. But I think sure Charlie and Callum have a few more uh, comments on that. Yeah, I think it's all well and good saying they really want to support the league and kind of get behind it. But as Charlie mentioned before, in, in terms of the funding was going to be slashed by up to 75%, you know, last January. So the proof is kind of in the pudding, really. And I mean, using Cornish Pirates mega result to try and kind of add some basis to the statement is just, I find it pretty disingenuous, to be honest. Yeah, I, 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 I just don't believe Bill like there when he says it was always part of the pathway part of the plan. I mean, as Carl said there, well, it was always part of the plan. Why were you cutting three quarters of the funding this time last year, just over 12 months ago? Like, it just strikes me as a bit of backtracking of, like I said, the, the unique situation we find ourselves in has meant there's huge interest in the Championship all of a sudden. That spotlight is on it because of the Saracens result against Pirates. And suddenly the RFU are going, oh God, maybe we have made the wrong choice here. We need to make it out that we'd never wanted to do it. Well, that's a blind man could see what your intention were for the championship were when you cut the funding. Like it was, it was easy. Like anyone could see it. Stevie Wonder was sat there going, "Well, I see what they're doing with the championship." <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so just be big enough. Be big enough to say, you know what? If, if you are going to now get invested in championship, be big enough to say, we we made a mistake. Actually, yeah, this time last year, thirteen months ago, forty months ago, we were going to get rid of it. But actually, what this has shown us is the championship has worth. We don't know how we're going to support yet, but we do plan to. Because actually, do they plan to support it? Or are they going to get Saracens up? And then we're going to be back to where we were. Because there's no relegation this year now. So there's no premiership club to worry about. So Ealing are obviously going to be the ones who will kick up us. And I'm telling you now, that Ealing side this season is more than premiership calibre. They will go in the premiership and give sides games this year. I have no doubt. But apart from that, who in the really would go up and week to week compete at the premiership? It's a tough question. Apart from Saracens and Ealing. Yes, on their day, you can have a good game, but over a year-long season, you could really go up. So are they going to get Saris up? Are they going to offer Ealing the chance to buy their way in, which you read reports that they might buy, buy shares, whatever, I don't know the ins and outs. Are they going to get those two up, have a 14-team premiership, ring fence it and go, cheers, champ, off you go. And they're just keeping us all happy at the moment until they get to do that. I, now, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that's not what they're doing. 
But w- after Eddie Jones' comments that he doesn't have any interest in the championship, yeah. after the comments of Bill Sweeney, other members of the RFU previously, and after the actions of the RFU, would anyone be surprised? No. Yes. Yeah. And then it has. So after after he made those quotes, he he did then go on in the same stanza to say. Um, he mentioned he referenced London Welsh, everything that went on there, which obviously was a terrible kind of situation. But actually, looking at the history of London Welsh, they went bust, I think, three times before the big one, so to speak. Um, so maybe they, they should never have been allowed into the Premiership in the first place there. But obviously, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Uh, he then went to say, What are we not doing? Which is a misconception is that we are introducing ring fencing. We have never said ring fencing. The RFU has never said ring fencing. But what we want to see is we want to see more exters. We want to enable a club with the business plan the foresight, the long-term commitment to be able to get into the premiership, that's not a problem. At the moment, there is a vast disparity between what it takes to be sustainable and competitive in the premiership and what it takes to do that in the championship. So that was, that was, the, that was the, the final quote. So obviously he went on to reference statistics. Obviously he's been, he, he got his pack back out for that one. That He obviously sat in front of the, uh, the championship committee uh, all the way back here in February, 2020. Um, so I found that interesting and obviously it was kind of perfect with today coming on. Obviously we've heard your thoughts there. Does, does that feel of more of the same? I think the RFU massively has a duty to make sure that things that happen, that the things that happened at Welsh don't happen again. Yes, they do. Mm. I was there at the end at Welsh. I was on, I seem like I'm always around. I was on loan at Welsh <laughs> when it ended from yeah, Gloucester yeah. and it was, it was horrible. It was sad. There were so many brilliant people there who lost their livelihoods and lost their paycheck. And it was horrible. A great club really, really struggled. They're still struggling. Like they're, they're doing well, but there'll be a long time to their back. So yes, the RFU has a duty to make sure that doesn't happen again. And yes, that means you've got to have your business plan and your long-term assets and maybe a lot of uh, fans, especially, but clubs and players, us players as well, maybe we don't quite understand what it takes to be competitive at Championship, to competitive at Premiership. But the thing that gets me there, Joe, is he says they want to see another Exeter. If you yeah. want to see another Exeter, you have to give the Championship your support. You yeah. have to. Because the big money makes the world go round, and the big difference at the moment is the championship clubs cannot compete apart from feeling financially with the premiership clubs. They just can't do it. If the RFU truly want to see another Exeter, they have to give the clubs the help. And what what doesn't give the clubs the help? Cutting 75% of their funding. At the end of the day, everything anyone the RFU says, it can be as great as you want. But that's the last meaningful action they gave to the championship when it came to finances and that will just underpin everything they say until there is something different that's your last meaningful action for me that speaks volumes to what your intentions with the championship are you cut three quarters of the funding how can you want anyone to compete with that yeah no i completely agree and i think everyone we, we always find ourselves going in these kind of roundabouts because obviously we're all aware the, the RFU pays £220 million a season to PRL in order to get the release of England players to, for the England squad. So that's £220 million a year. Compare that to what the championship clubs are paid. There is, again, as in the words of Bill, I suppose, a vast disparity between, between those things. So more food for thought there. Um, and this is obviously a debate that's going to rage on. So I'm sure we'll be here with Charlie, with Cal and with Chris again to, to discuss that one. Um, Charlie, you've got a week off this week, mate. That's quite enjoyable after a win against Nottingham at the weekend. Yeah, mate, we've got a week off. You know what? I really, really, really wish we didn't. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Because it's not just a week off. We've got, because of the re- the rest week next week, we've got two weeks in a row, which if you're 15 games into a season, is a quite nice little break. But actually, yeah. this is, like I said, it's a 10-game season. We've only played three games. We had two preseason games. We're actually... We got our first win last week. We're starting to find a little bit of form, start a very new team, starting to gel a little bit. Probably wanted just to keep momentum rolling and try and roll into our next game. Now we've got Cov away, which is a tough game. Yeah. So yes, it's great to have time to prepare for that and do more analysis and all that stuff. That's brilliant. But actually, two weeks off, probably at the moment, I know personally, I just I feel like I found a little bit of form. I feel like I'm in a good groove. Playing a lot of rugby. I played every minute of the season so far. I'm loving it. I just want to keep playing, mate, especially after so long without playing. So yeah, it, it, it's probably, when I look back in hindsight, I'd be like, actually, that rest is a good thing for us. Body feels better for it. But right now, I just want to plan. I'm, I was just talking to my missus about it. I'm doing her head in because I've not got anything to focus on this week. <laughs> like, I'm, I've got nothing to focus on. Most weeks now, I'm focused on Saturday. I've got nothing to focus on now. So she's like, you are just, I'm just sitting around the house doing nothing, getting bored. I'm doing my training and then I'm sitting there going, what do I focus on? But no, um, I spoke about, we we had an interesting start of the season. We um, 
tough loss against Doncaster first up. Uh, we lost 19-17, the game where if you outscore a side three tries to one and you lose the game, it's a disappointing one. But yeah. I think what we've seen from Doncaster is you said they're three from three. They're not playing. Speaking to a few of the boys, they've got quite a few ex-Jersey boys there who I know. They're not playing particularly well, but they're sat on 14, 13 points, something like that. So actually, they're in a good place because it's the old adage, isn't it? You play badly and you win. That's a sign of a good side. So they're, they're in a good place. Then we went to Ealing and oh, we spoke about Ealing already. We had a tough day at Ealing. We, you watch the game back. I'm like, oh, we're competitive in a lot of this. And it's 19-6 at half time. We're in the game. But against Ealing, you make a mistake and you're under your sticks. It's genuinely as brutal as that. And we just made too many mistakes. And then, yeah, it was a big, big game for us in Nottingham because we're in a similar situation with professionalism, the same professionalism, and we're in a similar place in the league. And, yeah, really good to get the um, five points at the weekend. We needed that to get our season really kick-started and get going. But we were saying, I reckon we, were at, we, were, we weren't at we at 100%. We were far from it. There's a lot still to come from us, a lot to gelling to do. But we've got to do it quickly because we're 30% through the season now. So, um, yeah, good win. Nice to have a week off in some respects. Would have liked just to keep playing, probably. Already can't wait to get out against Cov. I think it's two weeks on Sunday. So, yeah. But, mate, just, as I said, I'm loving Amptill. I'm having the best time playing. We've got a good side, good group of boys, and hopefully we can just get a few more wins on the board and um, climb our way up the league. Yeah, definitely. And immediately, I already know where I'm going to be in two Sundays' time. I'm going to be going down to Coventry again to watch Cov play Amptill. Um, a few games this weekend, obviously. Amptill, the only real big omission there. Uh, Callum. What are the fixtures for you to look out for this weekend? Obviously, I know you're going to Doncaster, so are we going to start there, maybe? Yeah, I think we'll start there. That's the standout for me. Like I already mentioned, these are two sides on three wins out of three. Um, I'm massively looking forward to being able to go to it. I'm privileged to be able to do so. It'll be my first live rugby union match in, in over a year, probably since last January I last went to one. Um, so, yeah, I'll be providing some, some content from there, some live tweets and whatnot. And I will be uploading a, a photo from the ground, which I'm sure some people will, will love on Twitter. Um, yeah, so that, that's massively the standout game, I've got to say. Um, yeah, yeah. It's Pirates are possibly shaded favourites, but being out of Doncaster, um, kind of for maybe the, the most 50 50 game of the weekend. Um, you mentioned Richmond Sarries as well, which should be another cracker. I think I've, but it's been since maybe the mid to late nineties that they last played in a, a league match. So kind of not been too familiar with with one another over the last twenty odd years. So yeah, I think that that'll be a great test for for Richmond. Aside from that, I've got um Bedford against Jersey and, and Nottingham Coventry. And then I think on Sunday it's Ealing Hartbury as well, which should be another interesting one. Hartbury have been throwing it about a bit recently as well. And um, we kind of mentioned what Ian have done in the first three weeks, but 50 points on and, and eight tries in three successive games. Okay. Um, put a bit more context into kind of how dominant they've been. They've, the, the 24 tries they've scored so far over three rounds is more than the next two biggest scorers put together. I think Pirates have got 12 tries and Hartbury 11, so they've been for a, a bit of an open game there, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of points. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I don't know if anyone saw the uh, the highlights package from the uh, the Hartbury game at the weekend. There was some mental things said on Sale on Comms. James Williams, who used to play for Sale, Chris, you you know, I think we've, we've both spoken to James. He yeah. eats the banana skin peel. What? That was just a fact that was... Yeah, just, just brought up on comms. In front of people. This was like with people watching. Someone just said, oh, he eats the banana skin. That's a nice line, I suppose, so. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna text him about that. I'm sure what that's exactly why Hartbury have been throwing the ball around because they're eating the banana <laughs> skins. Hartbury, Hartbury are quickly becoming uh, probably one of the most fun sides to watch in the league at the moment. Now I know Mark Cornwall, Pasty, and Barnsley. I'm not sure they'll enjoy that's what they're doing. They probably enjoy more <laughs> if they were a little bit more controlled and winning winning the games. But they're becoming a lot of fun to watch, and they're they're again they're they're a tough side to play. Um, I think a big story me is having been there know what it's like if this year is ridiculously tough for Jersey they've got to go off and on the island every every day for, sorry in the day for every game which is not what they do normally every I didn't do a single game we've flown a day when I was there flew in a day you go the night before nice hotel they're very good at that so that's a big challenge but they lose this weekend they're three from three on losses now knowing them and knowing how they would have looked at it, they probably would have said, you want two wins from three from those, because you'd, you'd probably expect to lose the Saris, even though 
I know Harvey will have had a great game plan to go there with. And up to about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, they were giving Saris a game as I knew they would. They will be very disappointed we're getting nothing out of the Richmond game. Not even a losing bonus point. That's poor. Now, they go to Bedford and lose. Bedford's a tough place to go. Bedford are a good size. They play a very good brand of rugby as well and they've got some good players. Some of your jersey, it's not panic stations, but you're going, this, this season's getting away from us a little bit. So that would be a very interesting game to see how that one pans out, I think. And in the context of both those side seasons, that could be a huge result either way. Mm, certainly. And as I have a timer on my screen saying your recording is going to get shut off rather soon, uh, I, I think it's probably the best time to wrap this up. But we're going to wrap this up by saying, who do we think is going to be making these, these playoff finals? And I'm going to start with Christoph Heel. Because he was the least prepared. I would say Ealing 100%. I think the way mm. they started, as I said before, they set the tone. Um, and just listening to Charlie talks there uh, that if you make a mistake against them, you will get punished. It's for that that seems to be a, a clinical approach there. But I'm going to, I'd say Ealing, but it's difficult, I think, after that. You know, the obvious statement is Saracens, but, you know, every single time I'm reading Callum's reports back or, you know, watch some of the highlights, Cornish Pirates are, are, are seemingly very confident, they seem to be very in the groove at the moment, so let's be a bit different let's forget Saracens and let's go Ealing and Pirates for the playoff Okay, uh, and then we'll go with Charlie who has the unenviable task of playing most of these guys So, um, Amptil obviously, uh, will be in Sorry, the playoffs. I forgot Amptil Clearly, yeah. no, um, <laughs> I think Ealing as you say and I do think it will be Saracens um, as much as I would love it the league to be Pirates uh, or Doncaster or anyone like that with Ealing, I think it'd be Saris. I think what we haven't spoken about and what you can't underestimate is Saris International. Back. Right. Mm. Those boys are probably going to play a little bit more than they thought they were now. Um, <laughs> and that will make a huge difference, huge difference. Um, so I'm going to say Ealing and Saracens, but they, over two legs, that will be an extremely interesting contest. And whatever date it is that they're playing in the league, I will, as long as I'm not playing, I'll be watching that because I cannot wait to see that one, especially after the pre-season results of even turned them over twice. But no, Ealing and Sarri, for me, will be, the, uh, will be in the final. OK, and we'll go with the man who's probably the most, you know, qualified person to answer this question. Uh, Callum, what, who, who do you think is going to make this uh, two-legged final we've got? I wasn't sure you were talking about me then when you said the most qualified, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, it's absolutely impossible to look past Ealing, you know, especially the way they've started from flying out. 50 points on three weeks running. First team sat on maximum points. Um, my, my head's going to say that Saracens will start to pick up now and kind of go on a run, especially with a few players back, even though the England contingent maybe aren't in their, their greatest of form. But um, I think, yeah, I'd like my heart will probably say Pirates might sneak in there if they can pick up five points on Saturday, um, be on four out of four, just past Doncaster. I think they've got a real good chance there. And soon they've already... Know, had the Saracens game first up, Pirates can probably afford a slip up in the, the next six games after that. Whereas the Saracens can't afford any more slip ups, so I think that might give them a small edge. So, yeah, definitely Elian and I'll plump with Pirates and go with Chris as well. <laughs> and I will say quickly before the recording ends, uh, Elian Cornish, because I'm going to be really easy with that one. So, we just finished the recording. I just want to say thank you very much. To everyone for watching this episode of the Talking Rugby Union podcast, whether you've listened to it online or whatever, however you've consumed the content, thank you very much for for listening. You can follow Talking Rugby Union at Talk Rugby Union on Twitter, uh, Talking Rugby Union on Instagram. Just type in Talking Rugby Union to LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever else, and you should find us there. Um, the social links for everyone else will be linked in the descriptions of the the podcast or the video, and you can. You can follow them there to, to find out more of their thoughts on the game of rugby and as well as some probably other assorted nonsense in there. Um, thank you very much for listening and I'm sure you'll hear us next time.